back and bigger than ever. It's the unofficial 40 from Soonerscoop.com. Now, here's the entire Sooner Scoop crew, Carrie, Josh, Eddie, and Bob. And George. All right, welcome back. It is another edition of the unofficial 40 podcast from Soonerscoop.com. The entire gang is here, even George. Uh, and yes, I know, I have... Uh, I, when I got a DM the other day and someone was like, uh, hey, um, you need to get the big voice guy to do George because he's on the podcast. And I was like, I know. I know. Uh, we have to kind of determine exactly kind of, you know, what the format is going to be moving forward. I mean, there so many people here. We're going to you know, have different types of pods and all that stuff. So uh, I will say Eddie walked in uh, on me today wearing the glasses that he loves so much. Yeah, I almost took a picture. You should have I taken almost, a picture. Well, I almost took a picture, but yeah. That, to be fair, I wasn't naked. I was just wearing special glasses. That's an interesting way to uh, start this podcast, <laughs> too. I walked in on you, and you were wearing those special glasses. Was it last week we started with the porn conversation? That's right. That this, everybody has brought up to me. And now I know about what is the thing, uh, something eyes, covenant eyes. I didn't know that was a thing, but that became a joke uh, on the board. That's right. Does the does the uh, anyway? Um, that was that was two weeks ago though. Two weeks ago, that's right. Um, so anyway, yeah, we're we're getting things done, uh, starting to build the studios. I I had some special glasses because I was soldering. I was soldering. Uh, if you don't know what that is, every, everybody knows what soldering is, right? Is that an old man thing? I have no idea. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> George was gonna. I love that I can go to George now. It used to be Eddie would be the one I'd ask, but now I know I can go to George and, and, and find out how old we are. That is a, a good representation of the age disparity here because I even know what soldering is. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 least, I feel like this is not I even an age thing. I think I just should is. know. I think I should just know. You what shouldn't this is. know. I mean, I, I think this is one of those things. It's, it's kind of like. It's like if you're a creep and you're building electronics in a basement somewhere, you know what soldering is. And that's basically what I'm doing. Yeah, you're either building Being a, a uh, you're either building a studio, or you're building a uh, a basement to bring little children to, <laughs> or bombs. Or, you don't know. Or or we, what are we doing here at the or that. scoop office? Uh, no, it's, a it's front. It's it is a front for <laughs> terrorist organization. Um, anyway, uh, it's be no, our first and last show on YouTube ever. We have a uh, yeah, they have. Community guidelines, we're breaking them right now. Um, so it's good we're not on YouTube. Anyway, we will be someday. Um, I'm not going to say soon. I'll just say someday. Anyway, uh, lots going on. Uh, football practices uh, continue. It's the final week before the spring game. Uh, we got Baker Mayfield coming up with his charity deal on Friday. We're going to be a part of it at Top Golf. That is sold out. So thanks to everybody that uh, bought a ticket or a bay or what have you. Uh, for the no bogeys with uh, Baker and Emily Mayfield. Uh, so going to be a lot of really cool stuff coming from that. We'll probably do a special pod uh, from that and talking to like Orlando Brown and Grant Calcaterra and stuff like that. So really excited about Friday. And then, of course, Kyler Murray having his uh, statue unveiling coming up this weekend, along with the red and white game. Uh, but outside of that, Josh is back from uh, his month-long vacation. Welcome back, Josh. Uh, yeah, the um, the better half of the month was just getting out of San Juan, Puerto Rico. Uh, so that was that was exciting. Um, but no, glad to be back. And guys, you know, I, I listened to last week's pod, you know, as I always do. Even it was it was probably more interesting this time since I wasn't, you know, already a part of it one time before. Um, I, I think it might be the vacation, but I'm feeling a little more. Um, uh, I'm feeling some positivity about this team suddenly. I don't. I don't know if it's just maybe the sun or. You really? You know, I saw your comments is. about the offensive line. I was like, who is this person? I, you know, I, I am. Like I said, I, I had some time to think about it. You know, I still am absolutely up for the doom pod. I think that is a fixture that we need to consider every yeah. year. But, um, but no, like I, I, I see some light at the end of the tunnel. I'm starting to see some things that, uh, that sound pretty good. I, the. Uh, again, I, I think anybody that knows me knows the O line and D line are where my head starts at, and there's, there's. I'm not saying this is going to suddenly be, you know, all fixed, but I feel like there's maybe some room for optimism. Well, uh, it, it's been great because Brent Venables has allowed us to watch practice uh, each week, uh, and you know, we've only had one practice availability the last two weeks, but you know, really, outside of, of we've talked to so many different people. 
Uh, I don't know how many more people you really want to talk to with all the the media availability, but uh, let's talk first. Let's go around a little bit. The enjoy uh, vision, fresh perspective, look around as uh, well. I mean, we're going to get to football. We always do plenty of football, but a lot of stuff going on in spring sports course, women's gymnastics, win the national championship. I actually, I don't know, did you guys watch any of that on TV? I actually did. I just Pearl loves it. Yes. Pearl loves it. Oh, she's a gymnast. Oh yeah. She loves the bars. She loves the rings. Even though that's not a women's event, but she anything that upper body strength, that's what she's all about. That's wow. I, I don't know how to process that. <laughs> uh no, but I mean I've always kind of been like I I don't really feel comfortable covering like women's gymnastics. I was I was having a discussion like who are the how much what kind of background check do like photographers have to pass to to take photos I, that's a terrible subject I'll get off of that I think most people are pretty professional uh, I, th I think so I would hope so uh, anyway no but that was great to see them win it's uh, was it two in a row right two in a row six of the last nine uh, and then of course uh, softball continues to roll uh, they went to Ohio uh, run ruled uh, the first two opponents did they I don't even know if that, they played a third game. no that, that, that's it they it was just just, they just played two it was a very Laid laid back week and now they're getting ready for Waco. I saw where uh, Alex Duraco was taken first in the uh, whatever league that is. What is that? Is there is there just one league now in softball or are there many? That is uh, Lauren Chamberlain's league. I knew it was started. Lauren Chamberlain's league, but is that like that's ex is that the only pro softball league for women? Uh, no, I I think that they still have. I think it's just another league. I okay. I'm not completely sure about that, but I think it's just another league that they have kind of begun. Uh, so, uh, yeah, she was taking number one and then, uh, you know, over the weekend, it was good to kind of see Bob, the bats get going again, uh, because they, I mean, not that they were side, but they got to actually, when they played Miami of Ohio, they actually got to face one pitcher the entire game. It was amazing. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's something, you know, Patty's mentioned a lot is that they'll get an early lead and then their bats just go quiet as if like, we did our job, we're done. Let's get to the next game. And that's, I mean, you hate to feel to label last week as like a like a scrimmage environment just to get your bats going again, but that's what it felt like, and we'll see if there's any care you know any carryover as they go to face the Bears. Yeah, it was two run rules. I don't think either were in the fifth, were they? They were both like in the sixth. I know the Miami one was a six inning run rule. I think. Yeah, there was one where they they put it on them in the sixth, but I don't know, Louisville. No, that was a five inning yeah, run that, rule. Yeah, yeah, they killed them. Uh, so anyway, Baylor coming up this weekend, right? Uh, in Waco, the scene of the crime. Yeah, the only loss of the season, and so yeah, you know the Bears, number sixteen in the country. They took two at Tennessee a couple of weeks ago. Who's number four? So and. Definitely going to be a tough one, yeah. And then that's one of my questions, I guess, for for Patty is, you know, how do you reconcile how nonchalant last week was to get you ready for a moment like this? Is that a concern? You don't think it would be because of what they've all been through, but they haven't really had a lot of good competition here in the last week and a half. By the way, we have passed the eleven thousand dollar mark in the uh, sleep eat uh, run rule uh, repeat shirts. Uh, getting in uh, new stock again this week and uh, actually going to get in some women's V-necks uh, coming in. Going to test those out as well. Uh, but thanks to everybody for uh, buying those. Go to Soonerscoopstore.com to purchase yours. All the proceeds will go into a softball NIL fund. Uh, so we appreciate everybody's support on that. And we'll keep going. Uh, and I think you guys do a great job. Like every time they play over the weekend, we have like, you know, 10, 11, 12 more people, you know, ordering shirts. So it's, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, and Eddie's doing a great job getting that stuff out. So thanks to everybody, SoonerScoopStore.com. Uh, all right, uh, we'll get into some football as well. Baseball, I don't know if you want to talk about that, Eddie, 19 runs last night. No, they're terrible. I mean, I just, I'll say this. We were sitting here watching I mean, they, 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 it in the, uh, in the office after practice. They're just, they do some stupid stuff, man. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're a good baseball team for moments, and then for a lot of other moments, they... Uh, are really bad. They play really bad baseball right now. When you can't throw strikes yeah. uh, and get people out, it makes the game a little bit tougher. Maybe it would help. Maybe they need a better vision, Eddie. You think that's possibly the problem? You know, I was thinking about the spring game a year ago, and I hadn't had LASIK yet. 
I hadn't gone through the process with the fine folks of Enjoy. And you know how windy it gets during April, don't you? Here in Oklahoma, It's George, terrible. It's it was terrible. bad yesterday. It was I got, bad yesterday. I got a little bit of dust in my eyes a year ago at the spring <laughs> game. And uh, I actually drove home and killed a family on the way home. And it was because I couldn't see. A family of? Uh, chipmunks. Okay. And it you know, kind of goes back to this idea of I hadn't gone to Enjoy yet. And you probably are wondering, what's Enjoy? And, well, I'll tell you, it's the best laser vision center in Oklahoma City. It's not even close. Combination of mind-blowing technology, experienced eyeball surgeons, and exceptional patient care is life-changing. It was life-changing for me, Carrie. And now I can see. And this year, I don't think that I'm going to be killing any type of animals on the way home because I'm going to be able to see the road because of Enjoy Vision. Does that sound good to you guys? <laughs> that might have been the greatest <laughs> ad read. <laughs> Every unofficial 40 listener in the universe, they get $400 off of LASIK. Yeah, so this is what you need to do. Tell them how. You go to enjoywithme.com. That is the letter N, J-O-Y, withme.com, promo code U40, and you too can have the life-changing Enjoy Vision experience. This is where you LASIK. Uh, all right. Thanks to Enjoy. And uh, we continue the Enjoy Fresh Perspective, Enjoy Vision Fresh Perspective look around. Uh, as we get to what everybody wants to get to, which is football, and uh, George has been sitting patiently, I know. Uh, but, I mean, heading into the spring game, George, your first spring back, uh, I, I'm sure you're happy with the access compared to what you've known in the past at Oklahoma. Um, but you got to talk to a lot of uh, you know transfers yesterday. Uh, Lace, the Jacob Lacey kid, uh, Rondell ba- Bothroyd. Uh, it, but I think you guys came in here yesterday because I wasn't over there, but I was in the office. You guys came back and you said, wow, Jaden Gibson, what an impressive dude. Yeah, he was, he might've been the best interview of all of spring practice. I think he's up there with, you know, I, DJ Graham was obviously really good, but he's a guy that you'd expect to be good at this point too. Cause he's, you know, he's obviously been around, but for a guy like Jaden Gibson, who I think there's been definitely some question marks about like, you know, what is this kid we about might transfer? Yeah. I mean, there was, you know, talk about, you know, see somebody that would go in the portal. Obviously we had the, uh, the arrest thing that was, what was that like a month ago? Oh, I forgot about that. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. On campus corner, which really was the not PI. a big, not yeah. a big deal. Uh, but you know, there's just some question marks about him. Is he a guy that can be a playmaker? And man, I, you know, if he, if he's not a playmaker, he's, he's a heck of a talker. That's for sure. Um, I mean, he, he talked our ear off for 10 minutes and, and he talked a lot about just this last year, how big it was for him while he wasn't on the field, just mentally, you know, growing up as a player and a person. And I, I think that that's kind of what you want to hear from a guy like that. Cause it, he looks the part, right. And sure. I think we all agree that he's got a great skill set being such a big bodied receiver, but can it all connect, you know, mentally. And I, I think that was good to hear from him yesterday. It was not necessarily awkward. It was just, I, I think he basically kind of came out and said, like, I was a little bit of a shithead as a freshman, yeah. and I had mm-hmm. some mature maturation to do. And it certainly sounds like he's made that step. I, You know, obviously the next step is uh, actually getting out there on Saturdays and contributing. Well, and, and by the way, if you want to see those uh, those videos, just go to YouTube, uh, search Sooner Scoop. Uh, it, Sooner Scoop editorial will come up, and that's where you can find all the post-practice interviews uh and you know just watching those last night and earlier today uh you know Rondell Bothroyd was a guy that really stood out to me and George you wrote about him this morning uh but really just comes off as a guy that is just happy to be at Oklahoma happy to have this chance yeah he's kind of the opposite of Jaden Gibson but still in a good way like in the sense that Jaden Gibson it was very clear he was a great talker but he's young and was just you know rambling most of the time Bothroyd was very clearly a veteran and was saying good stuff and good information, but he's been around the block a few times. I didn't realize he was a team captain at Wake Forest last year. I think that, you know, that's something that this team lacked a little bit last year in terms of leadership. Uh, I think he's a guy that obviously has played a lot of football before. He's played it at a high level to at a place like Wake Forest. I think that he can come in and be a guy that not only produces on the field, but is a guy that can kind of lead that room that, I don't think they've really had a ton of leaders there, and that's kind of what I wrote about yesterday is, is they went out and they got two guys in, in Bothroyd and Trace Ford that have played a lot of football, have been around the block, and uh, can, can kind of be that voice in, in a room that really struggled last year. 
And I think that's something that's kind of been a common theme. Like Trace Ford, you really get the sense like he's just really ha- happy to be at a place like Oklahoma that has the tradition and the history and to be able to play here. And even going back to like last year when transfers came in, I think guys like Kanai Walker, when you talk to him, uh, it really kind of sh- you know shows and proves like what a destination Oklahoma is for some of these guys that have seen a lot of football. Yeah, I mean, even Devon Sears, I mean, obviously he comes from a place like Texas State. Yeah. He was talking about it yesterday about, you know, playing in front of, uh, you know, 50,000 people on Saturday, if that's how many people show up, will be the most he's ever played in front of in his career. And he said even just the program itself, the nutrition, everything that goes into, uh, you know, playing at a, a blue blood program like Oklahoma, it's just a totally different world for some of these guys. And even a Trace Ford and, and you know, Rondell Bothroyd, I mean, they played at Power 5 schools, but... The reality is, is, you know, Wake Forest and Oklahoma State are, are good programs, but it's different playing at a place like Oklahoma. Just can you get to the level that Oklahoma has been? Exactly. Uh, is is the biggest question. And, and uh, I don't know, Eddie, Bob, I, what you saw yesterday, I know you said it was kind of anticlimactic. Mm-hmm. Uh, just, you know, they were on the field and didn't really do a ton of stuff that was interesting, but... Uh, just kind of overall, your your impressions of, of what you've seen throughout the spring. Uh, maybe on either, maybe one of you can take uh, the offense, the other defense. Which one do you want? I'll, I'll start with defense because I, <laughs> I I do think that you look at you know in particular kind of what Josh was talking about, like that defensive tackle group. Uh, we talked to Todd Bates a week ago. You look at that defensive tackle group, and obviously like Derek LeBlanc and you know Ashton Sanders and those guys. It's it's fun to see them out there, but to think, are they going to be truly contributors on a team that has a Jonah Laulu who's moving inside? And, you know, there's, he's kind of been, I guess, the buzz of the last couple of weeks just as far as talking to Todd Bates and seeing what that group's going to be, whether it be a Jordan Kelly, uh, Devon Sears, <laughs> Jacob Lacey. Like, those are four guys that should be able to give you something on the interior. Uh, you know, how good can those guys be? I'm not sure. I'm somewhat intrigued by Devon Sears after hearing Bates talk about him and just the ability to get after the quarterback. Uh, that's an obvious uh, talking and buzz point or buzzword that has come out of uh, practice here over the last couple of weeks is uh, they need to get more con- contribution. Uh, they need to get more, you know, just outright pressure from the inside. And I think it's going to be kind of interesting to see how all this comes together here over the course of the next couple of months as they lead into the season. Going to offense, I look at running back, offensive line. Running back, Gavin Sawchuk looks like he's taking the reins. Like, yeah. this is his room. He's going to show you what, what he brings to the table. Now, that's not to say Javante Barnes is going to be a huge part of it, but since he's been out the second half of spring, it's almost like something clicked with Gavin. It's like, this is my time to really assert who I'm going to be and what I want this room to try to be here going forward. And... You know, we mentioned it on the board, just no Marcus Major at practice, just not not even around. So we don't know what to really read into that at uh, you know at this point. But there were only four running backs out there. Dalen Smothers, Caleb Hicks, Toby Walker, and Sawchuck. And so that was, I remember asking Brent about that the very first day of spring. How are you going to use your running backs? Are you afraid of them going down? And, you know, sort of seeing that. You know, he hasn't been afraid to be physical, but because of that, they don't have a a lot of backs going into this spring game. So I'm kind of curious to see how they navigate that spot. Then offensive line, Savion Bird was the one that I really want to talk to you yesterday. Got finally got that chance. And just hearing him talk about how much he, you know, appreciated what the Florida state game was able to do for him. And then if I was like, it's about time, it's about time. I took advantage of the opportunities that I've been given. He didn't say it was like, oh, I just hadn't been, you know, getting any shots to do anything. Like Bill wasn't giving me a, a chance to try to make my name. It's like it finally clicked with me. This is what I need to do to be, become a real time player here. And, you know, he can you can tell that mentally he's a much different guy, but physically He's still, he's got to put on that weight. You could hear from Bill's voice a couple weeks ago. He wasn't happy that Savion was 280. So that's something that's got to change here going into summer. I'd also say, I don't, I don't know if we're going to see Smothers in the spring game because I saw he had a big like club on his one arm. I don't know if they're going to play him. So we might get a lot of Tawi Walker 
in the spring game on Saturday. He's going to be my MVP. It, he's a he's a perfect candidate for that. Walk on is. running back is always a good candidate. Well, well, walk they get on the receiver most- or walk on running back always the best candidates for spring game MVP. They get the most opportunity, right? You're not going to be just chunking the ball all over the yard, so they get the most opportunity to show out. Yeah. And basically, if you show out in a spring game, that means that's a little bit of code for you. He busted a big run. Josh, I'm going to go with uh, Dom Whaley as the best spring game MVP of all time. You know, and almost like the... I guess he'll always come up because he's such an outlier because he actually did something. You know, like it's always, oh, this spring game guy, maybe he's going to be a guy. No, he's not. Not like Jermaine Hardison who starred for like... Four years in the spring game. Daniel Brooks it's, had a back-to-back run. Daniel Brooks, yeah. <laughs> it's almost a curse. But he was a scholarship like, player. Daniel Brooks it. was a scholarship player. Marcellus Sutton yeah. had a big one, didn't he? A few years ago. He had like three touchdowns. Yeah, but he was a scholarship guy. We, we're talking That's about true. the walk-ons. The MVP usually has to be a walk-on. It, it's, it's like the same argument that I was having when Jackson Arnold won Gatorade Player of the Year. And everybody's like, well, that means he's going to be a star. Uh-uh, look at that list. Don't do not do this to yourself. Like, the MVP's like, no, nah, I, don't, I don't want it. I don't want the Madden cover. I don't want any of that shit. Like, leave it alone because it's, it, is, it doesn't usually end well. And Even see, for the guys that are scholarships. Here's the problem. After watching all those guys that, that were stars, that were walk-ons, then I got used to shitting on those guys right as Dom Whaley was coming through and starring. <laughs> it was the worst. It was maybe the coldest take I've ever had. And then if not for that Kansas State game where his knee or his leg just got torn into shreds, like he would have been a stud. At OU. And he would I think he would have played in the NFL for four or five years. Uh, he, he was a, like, and Kerry, like he, I, I wasn't, you really committed to that, but I was behind you. Like, I agreed with what you were saying. <laughs> but you really took a lot of the brunt of that for me. Like, you were my shield a little bit. But, I mean, because we – we that was our comeuppance because we were totally were like f***ing walk-ons. Like, we're not worrying about that. Like, we're not doing that. And, of course, Adam Whaley comes. Like, there's always, like, one every four or five years that you're like, crap. Okay, yeah, every once in a blue moon, one of these guys becomes a relevant football player in a place like Oklahoma. But the, I mean, with Don Whaley, there was nothing really particularly particularly great that he did. He's just he was just solid overall, and he was faster than we gave him credit for. Mm-hmm. Oh, you you know the guy I always bring up because I it was my freshman year at OU was that Elijah Von Stoenhook kid in like two thousand <laughs> two thousand one that like Bob was like this guy he's really impressed us so far in camp and like I was young and dumb enough to be like like telling my buddies like. Look out for this guy. He's going to be a player, man. Hey, I don't think he ever took a meaningful snap in his entire career. Well, get ready for another round, and you will not find me shitting on any walk-ons that have a great day. Just just Dom Whaley has forever changed me. Kerry, I feel like the last few pods, and again, I wasn't the one last week, but I thought there's been some real growth from you lately. Like that, That's a real growing moment from you. I'm, 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 I'm proud. I'm like Switzerland now. I just, I just, I'm just here to support everyone else and not get my ass shredded on Twitter. You notice I don't really even fight on Twitter anymore, which a lot of people hate. Do, do you want to talk about, like, Nebraska running backs? Like, just, you know, just spitballing. He's still not here. any good. I mean, I, <laughs> he's not. He just happened to stuck around the league. For, is, is uh, what's his name? Uh, Woody Vanhead or whatever they named the van Ooh. after on... On, uh, Danny, Woodhead. On Danny Woodhead, is he still in the league? No, he's playing golf. Is he really? He's a very accomplished amateur golfer. Really? Mm-hmm. I had no idea. Tried to qualify for the U.S. I didn't Open. I not know that either. Wow. But, I mean, he was – look, Rex Burkhead, I salute you. You figured out how to have an NFL career when many others have failed before you with your talent level. He kicked uh, Sam McGuffey's ass, so whatever, you know. Did Sam McGuffey ever even get on a practice squad? I don't think so. Last I knew, Sam McGuffey was doing bobsled. Oh, that's right. He switched to bobsled. But that uh-huh. was like in 08 or something, wasn't it? Or Yeah. Well, and like, no, I mean, knowing the very limited information I know about bobsled, you're like, 
okay explosive athlete big strong guy yeah like okay we know speaking of that class you know Stephen good is a strong man now right yeah um i actually ran into one of his uh when we were at um oh uh the uh the under armor camp a few weeks ago eddie uh eddie and i ran into one of his old assistants at paris a guy that uh, is a member of the board actually a guy we see fairly regularly at all these camps um and he was telling me that he like he finally got his back and some kind of health he's been doing like i want to say he told me yoga or something like it's finally got his back like because his uh, for people that don't realize Stephen good's back when he left ou was just destroyed like just he he was that's why he never got to become the player he could have been and was just not right and he's taken him years and years and years he's lost all this weight but yeah Stephen good was like um i think in his weight class he finished like eighth at nationals or something in in strongman competition Yeah, we're talking about those guys that lift those atlas stones and all that stuff yeah yeah crazy stuff um by the way that did i don't know if you any of you guys saw the story on espn about the guy that's the current strongman champion but he has like autism he's like he's like really high on the spectrum too but like his brother his brother was a strong man he got him into it and the whole having a, a schedule where he had to eat, you know, all that food all day long and work out like it, it centered him and it gave him a purpose. And it like, and it just made it just being autistic lended itself to him doing all the stuff he needed to do be, to become that strong. So it's pretty cool. That's wild. Uh, anyway, back uh, to football. Um, Josh, I wanted to ask you, I, I mentioned this earlier. You have come back from, holiday we're not british but i'll just call it that since you were out of the country uh and you basically are beaming about the offensive line on the boards i i (laughs) excuse me i kind of am um i so as i look at it i think tyler guyton again we everybody knows tyler guyton has a chance like i think tyler guyton could be a top 10 pick someday like i legitimately believe that he is that big that athletic that gifted um now does he get there i don't know like i mean it's obviously a big question you know that we all have to kind of watch but i think it's savion bird you if he can take that left guard job which it sounds like he's kind of doing if he can do that it gives Oklahoma a guy that plays with an attitude that they haven't had in a couple of years. Guys, like we used to talk about, oh, you know, Ben Powers and Drew Samia, they kind of ran that ragged edge. But they they were kind of, you know, I guess to borrow a military, like tip of the spear kind of guys. Like they were always going to be there. If there was something to mix it up with somebody, they were going to get after him. I mean, th- those guys, I I don't know if Brecken Hager is right to this day. Like they, they destroyed him and that – uh, Big 12 championship game, and I, I see if I see something like that in Savion Bird. Like he plays right on that edge of out of control, and I, I, you don't want five guys like that. But if you have a couple guys like that that can kind of instill an attitude of this is how we play, this is what we do, I, I like that. And then, you know, at left tackle, it's obviously a huge question mark with Walter Rouse. Um, but you know, I, I listened to Gabe and Teddy talking about it and saying how, how well Caden Green's coming along. And, you know, people were like, Oh, he's changed his body. He started doing that before he got to Oklahoma. He, he amazed me with what he looked like when I saw him as a sophomore to when I saw him at the Under Armour All American game. That that dude had changed his body tremendous I mean, lost at least thirty pounds of just fat. And so I, I think you are again that's a true freshman i'm not saying you count on him but it gives me a little more hope that maybe if walter rouse isn't ready or needs a couple weeks even early in the season to to kind of fine tune that they can bridge that gap they can might kind of make that okay Uh, andrew rame's a good center he seems like he's going to be there for the summer to go through workouts finally have a full i mean kind of full off season to really be in the weight room to get the strength that he's needed since he was a high school kid that it's it's people like want to put it on Andrew. It's not Andrew. Like he's had injury problems that have just prevented him. And then even his freshman year with the COVID, you know, they didn't get to have a true summer. So he's just really never been able to just be in the weight room and be that kind of guy. My, my only question is right guard. I, I McCabe Matai. I mean, and it, Honestly, if McCade Matower, a guy with all his experience, if that's your worst offensive lineman, 
I think you could be pretty good. Now, my hope for this group is that like Jake Taylor goes and takes that job. I like, and I know I, I heard he's working at left tackle, and that's fine. You know, we all know Bill loves to cross train and move guys all around and experiment with with lots of different lineups. So that's that's just the way that works. But if they could, if Jake Taylor or somebody like that would go take that right guard job, I think that's a really good offensive line. The potential, like end of season, to be up there with that that probably the 2019 group was that last really good offensive line group. And, you know, we were talking about this the other day with the, the Caleb Atian kid leaving Oklahoma State. Uh, you know, he, he started all their games last year. Um, but to survive as, a, as a, just a college football program anymore, you've got to have those veteran guys, and you've got to have those, that next level of young guys that are starting to come into their own, and then you've got to have the talented, you know, kids that just aren't ready yet. Uh, and, you know, we, we saw that a little bit last year. Uh, with the injuries they had, and then Wanya Moore stopped playing in the bowl game, and then I think you felt like, okay, well, that offensive line with Guyton and those guys, it looks like they could put something together. And for all the crap that Bill Beatonbow's taken, like it does start to seem like things are are kind of turning around a little bit, just with the development overall on that offensive line. Oh, I I don't think there's any question because all this forgets Jacob Sexton, a guy they were willing to start as a true freshman against Florida State, who we know had some elite pass rushers. Um, you know, and obviously Jacob's not going to be ready to go from day one or anything like that, but they clearly think a lot of his talent with the way, you know, I remember, you know, guys, I was listening to somebody else talk about this the other day. It wasn't that long ago that a, that an ACL injury was like, oh, I don't know if his career is going to be the same. Like now – it's just like, okay, he's got to get that right. Like, you rarely see the guy who just is a shadow of, him former, as of his former self. Like, he may not be quite as good. He may not be perfect. But he's still a really, really good replicant of the, the guy he used to be. So, I, Jacob Sexton, like I said, he's always been a worker. Uh, you know, he's not a guy that carries a lot of bad weight. So, I, I don't think you're going to see And he was going to be a troubles. starter in that bowl game. Yeah. I, I, guys, if he starts in that bowl game, I don't know if Walter Rouse is on the roster. Like, I wonder about that very legitimately. Like, there was clear belief that he was going to be a guy. Well, I guess technically, didn't he get hurt, like, right at the beginning of the yeah, game, first he, series? Yeah, there's, like, the second play, maybe? Second or third Something play? Something like that. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, he, he I, did start. He officially got the start. Oh, yeah, 100% start. Like, I want to say <laughs> it was the third play, I think. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I just mean, like, if he had had a chance to go... And he good, puts out a good performance there. I, you know, OU's probably thinking, "Hey, we're we're pretty good at left tackle next year. I mean, we do, we can we can work with that. And let him grow all off season, and then we're in good shape." Uh, let's hit the portal a little bit because a couple Sooners have hit the portal. Uh, but before we do that, um, I want to tell you guys about Prime Shrimp. I'm sorry, it's not a great segue this this week. Uh, PrimeShrimp.com. Go check them out. Uh, lots of different shrimp uh, tastings for you to choose from. Uh, whether you like uh, the Cajun style or uh, just something uh, a little bit, uh, maybe a little Italian uh, or the garlic herb butter shrimp, uh, that's fantastic as well. But go go to primeshrimp.com, uh, put in the, the code U40, and uh, if you order $50 or more of shrimp, you will get 25% off your entire order. And that could be the New Orleans style barbecue, the French Quarter Alfredo, uh, you know, one of my favorites as well. Uh, but I know uh, Josh and his wife like the signature Cajun, uh, or the yeah the signature Cajun seasoned shrimp. Uh, but you know, just try it. It's it's great. It's a it's a restaurant quality meal. I am. Uh, I didn't tell you guys this. I went to the doctor. Had some some bad levels. So uh, I am uh, off the DoorDash for a while. Thank God. I, I I'm I'm gonna lean more on Prime Shrimp. Some healthier alternatives. Uh, someone was making fun of me for saying Cato. I said Keto. I think. Uh, maybe I said Cato. I don't. You said Cato. Did I? I, I you remember. You said Cato. Did I yeah. say Cato? I was okay. You, you said it's Cato. I, I, I knew thought, it. Yeah. I knew it's Keto. I just. <laughs> I thought about reading, correcting folks. you, but I was like, I, I you can correct me anytime. Uh, paleo friendly, gluten free, uh, all the options for you. But restaurant quality meals at home in under ten minutes. Just boil that water, put the shrimp in, take it out, and you got a restaurant quality meal. And you didn't pay thirty dollars in DoorDash fees. So uh, go to Prime Shrimp now. Uh, and uh, get use that promo code U40 get 25% off your entire order of $50 and more uh, or more and now remember single packs so 
a little bit cheaper, $10, $11 per uh, per, uh, serving. So go check them out, primeshrimp.com, great sponsor of the pod. All right, transfer portal, a couple of entries. Corey Roberson, not surprising. We were all wondering, you know, for a couple of years, really, if he was a possibility to enter. Turns out he's just kind of a kid that loved it at OU, loved loved being on campus, going to school here, got his degree, and knows he's not going to play and didn't seem like from last year that Todd Bates really had him uh, in his plans. So, uh, I don't know. I mean, I think we were all expecting that this would happen. Not a huge loss, but still a guy I thought showed a lot of promise. And then the one that kind of hurts me personally is Jaden Davis entering the, the portal. And I, 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 George, I guess that says as much about the corner position as anything that, that he just knows he's not in the plans to be a starter next year. Yeah. And, and from my understanding too, Jaden graduates this spring. And so I think that that was part of it because the, the hours are always hard to sort of transfer over. And so I think that he was probably thinking about portaling after the season and then obviously stuck it out because he is graduating um, this May. So I, I think that he, he went through the spring and, you know, I'm sure that he thought about sticking around, but the, I think the writing on the wall is there with that group. I mean, you look at, obviously they're really high on Gentry Williams. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't gotten to speak with him this spring. Um, I was hoping that would happen and I don't know if he's going to play on Saturday. I hope so. I hope we get to see him because I think that I, he's the guy that I think is going to end up starting there. Um, they're also really high on Kendall Dolby. Um, I think he's had a really good spring. And then you talk about some of the young guys, Vickers and, and Wagner. All I've heard is really good things about both those guys. Uh, and that's not even mentioning, you know, Connie Walker, a guy that played a little bit last year. I, I think he could compete. So I think that it just became one of those situations where Jaden saw the writing on the wall. Uh, he wanted to get his degree. And, and now, you know, I'm sure he'll have some interest from from some other schools, but I think that that now opens the door really for Gentry or, or Dolby to maybe take that other spot across from, from Woody. Yeah. And I mean, you know, without Jaden Davis, it does take away a little bit of a safety net. Um, and you know, he was a guy that was productive. I mean, I thought he had, he had a decent year last year. I mean, I think Woody Washington's the only player you could say had a great year at corner, uh, except for that TCU game, which was still bizarre, but you're going to have to lean on some young guys. Yeah, and you can always move DJ Graham back. <laughs> um, if that doesn't work out. I don't see out. that happening after yeah. your long story. That That's you true. Wrote on him. Uh, but, you know, yeah, I think they are going to have to re- rely on some young guys. But I, I think that they they really like Gentry. And I think before that whole episode, you know, in workouts, I think that there was a lot of people already penciling him in as the starter um, over there on the other side. So. You know, I, I think that that's... It's a little sc- scary, though, because Woody hasn't exactly stayed healthy his entire career. Yeah. Mm, nope. But I, 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 I still think, though, that they, they feel really good about, um, you know, Gentry and Dolby. And then I, I think, again, I've heard really good things about Vickers and, and Wagner. I know Wagner's been a little bit banged up. But I, I think that those four guys um, are the future there. And, and you know, I think that they, they feel comfortable throwing those guys out there. Uh, outside of that, I mean, um, I don't know. I mean, is anybody, Bob, Eddie, do you have your eye on anybody else that you're eyeing in the portal that you think could be a possibility? Mm. Not really. I mean, outside of people that are going to contribute? No. Right. Uh, there let's, might be let's some, phrase it that way. There yeah. might be some guys that enter the portal and you just go, okay, whatever. But I don't think anybody outside of, like, Odd Jaden Davis. Like somebody asked me last week if I thought anybody was going to enter, I'd mention Jaden Davis's name. That just seemed like a very, mm-hmm. uh, it, it, it seemed like it was going to happen eventually, or maybe not. But no, not really. Maybe like maybe one of the punters. That's not going to like seriously. I'm I I don't know anybody else that would come out of spring that goes yeah this isn't for me. Maybe, maybe an offensive lineman. Maybe. I with guys with what we hear about Josh Bates and how it sounds like he's really impressed some people early on. You wonder a little bit about Nate Anderson. Mm, like sure, that's point, the one I was thinking uh, about. Yeah, yeah, a guy like that. You kind of wonder, like I, I Nate came in so slight, and I just I just wonder if he's ever going to have the body type that Bill feels comfortable with. They also just offered. Um, the, I can't remember his name, but the kid, or I don't know if they, did they offer the kid from Appalachian State? Yeah. Yep. Um, and he's a, is, yeah, he's, he's um, a center guard, isn't he? 
Uh huh. He yep. is. He is. Um, what is that kid's name? He was in the athletics article too about Brent FaceTiming him and and stuff like that. Um, so I I don't know. I mean, it, when you when you Troy see, Everett, Troy Everett's the guy's name. Yeah. So when you see offers like that, you just kind of say, okay, well then is are they processing somebody? Yeah. Right. Um, or they they kind of know something's gonna happen. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and we'll we're still working just to see what was up with Marcus Major because yeah. I think that that might be one. It may, it might. I, I mean, could anybody blame Marcus at this point? Like, I, it almost feels like he's snake bitten. Like, I just I yeah. feel like it's always something with that guy. Unless it's and unless wonder, it's a situation that he just wants to get a fresh start somewhere. Like, yeah, I, yeah, I would blame him if he just threw his hands up in there and said, "Well, this." Oklahoma thing just hasn't worked out because they hate me or something. You know, I'm oh, making yeah. stuff up. But I mean, I mean, and again, it's been a while since I talked to Marcus. I Marcus has never come across as that kind of kid to me at all. Like he, he just, again, like we, we joked for years about his, you know, his uh, lack of notoriety in the Millwood offense. And he never fussed about it. He never complained. He never acted mad. Just kind of did his thing, man. Kind of handled his own business. Um, Guys, what I wonder about, I'm, you know, I know, um, you know, I was watching you guys, uh, the interview, I think you got with Todd Bates. It's, I know it's been a little while now, but I was kind of catching up on some stuff I missed a guy like Marcus Stripling, like is surely Marcus Stripling, like knows he's good enough that he could go to, you know, he could do what, um, Oh, the, the big offensive lineman whose name I confused Marcus Alexander. He'd go to Texas state and be a guy if he wanted to be, um, you know, I, I just that, that those are the kind of guys like the fringy guys like, yeah, he'll get some snaps this year. But does he want to be a 12 snap a game guy at OU or does he want to be a 40 snap a game guy at, you know, kind of a G5 type plays? Well, I, that's probably one of those honest conversations that you just have to have with a guy. And I would imagine that well, with the way that defensive end looks right now, uh, you know, how much like. If PJ was a, if this was his second spring or something, I imagine Marcus Stripling's already gone, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, but guys, I mean, the reality is three more have to go because it's oh, they're at 76 right now with 12 incoming guys and they're offering portal guys. So bare minimum is three. Like you might be talking four or five. So it's got to go from somewhere. And, you know, I, I don't know if it's from harsh, com you know, not harsh, but just real conversations they're going to have to have with these guys, or if it's guys that are just disgruntled or, you know, realize, you know, they can see the writing on the wall or what it is. But I mean, there's still some blood to be shed. There's no doubt. Here's the thing, though. You, you've, if you're smart about it, you've got to have a landing place before you even declare. I mean, We've all seen all the guys that went in the portal and still haven't found a home. Even guys at OU still haven't found a home. Like, in this day and age, I would think that, you know, a Marcus Stripling would have to go to a Texas State and say, I'm thinking about leaving. Do you have a spot for me? Would you take me? And he'd have to get an absolutely yes, we will, before he announces. If you're smart about it, you've got to do it that way. Well, I, you know, and I'm again, and this is, this is absolutely just a shot in the dark, but the guy who recruited him to Oklahoma is right down the road in Dallas at SMU. I mean, Calvin Thibodeau was yeah. was Marcus Stripling's guy. Now, again, I'm not implying anything. I'm just saying that's the kind of school I could see him easily falling into, and all of a sudden he's got a lot bigger role. Yeah. Well, I, maybe Dylan Gabriel will transfer after this spring. Well, Since I mean, Jackson Arnold's taking a spot. Yeah. I think that word is he's in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think people think sometimes like what that would look like. Like you're not benching Dylan Gabriel. Not yet. Before he plays a snap. He's got to go out and suck. It's just it, like with Spencer Rattler. You weren't going to bench him even though you thought Caleb Williams might be better. I just feel like this, this entire conversation is just A, exhausting because it's April 19th. Yeah. And B, it just like, for instance, I love Dylan Buckingham to death. We worked together in radio, but like I asked him, like he was over at practice yesterday. And I asked him like what one of the things was that uh, really stuck out to him. And he's like, man, I was really I was it, he basically was said that he was surprised how well 
uh, Jackson throws the ball. And I, I think there was somebody at one of the first viewings that said that as well. And I just like, I guess it, I, I become frustrated with that, like just that phrase. Cause it's like, do you, he was a five star. Do you not think that he can <laughs> really sling the ball around? Also, there's just a, like, I hope people understand there's a difference between throwing a five yard pass in practice versus having to read coverages yeah. in a game. Sure. And, I think that this there's this idea, and we talked about this last week, there's this idea that you can just throw somebody out there like a Caleb Williams in the craziest environment, and they're just going to excel. He is a generational player, and I'm not saying Jackson Earl is not going to be a great player, but Dylan Gabriel is the starting quarterback for this football team, and that's how it's going to be unless he gets injured or he just goes out there and is terrible. And sure. I just don't think he, that's going to happen. And I don't know. I just... Here's a here's a really good example. I mean, to me, it's it's Tanner Mordecai. Like, you go out watch practice and you go, "Wow, that guy really throws it well." It took him some time to become a really good quarterback, and he's at Wisconsin now. But what he did, he put up huge numbers at SMU. I mean, massive numbers. Well, he's gonna uh, start uh, at Wisconsin. Good example has uh, it's come up. Spencer Rattler. Like the first practice, Spencer Rattler. I was people were like, "Holy shit, that guy can sling it." Like, everybody was just enamored with his arm talent. And I'm still not sure he's a good quarterback. Like, all these years later, I'm still not sure he's a quality college quarterback. And I, there's evidence that says yes, and there's evidence that says no. And so, like, I agree with, you know, what both Eddie and George were saying. Like, he's a five-star. The dude, It's going to look pretty coming off his hand. I guarantee it. But beyond that, I, I don't know. Like, I, I, I don't know. And... I, I think the Rattler Williams thing is really apt to this year because look how hard Williams had to fight to overtake Rattler. And I, I couldn't agree with George Moore. Like Caleb Williams is going to be the number one pick next year. Like Caleb Williams was on that trajectory from that day at the cotton bowl. Like that he is special and there's just no way around it. And people can hate him all they want. It doesn't change reality. Um, at the same time, I think Dylan Gabriel's clearly proven himself to be a better quarterback than Spencer Rattler. And I I, I like Jackson Arnold a lot. I don't I, I'm not making the same bet on Jackson Arnold that I, you know, would have made on Caleb Williams as a freshman based on the things I'm hearing. And I hear great stuff. Like everybody's super and I, that led woke a couple of weeks ago. The the reviews I was hearing on Jackson Arnold and how excited everyone is. But it's like Caleb Williams, they were like, I mean, there were people that were like, he's different. Like that guy's not normal. Some of the stuff he's doing every day in practice. So uh, people just, the, the, uh, this is when expectations get crazy and like, oh, Jackson Arnold, you know, he, I don't know if he's that good. He couldn't take the job from Dylan Gabriel. God, that's really hard to do guys. And that offense is super complex and it has all these things and everybody's like, I, I was listening to something the other day and they were talking about like more than any offense in the sport, the coaches that run it, like Levy and Heupel and those guys, are so secretive about what they do. There's not like like they are very cautious about who they tell and what they talk about. They don't go to coaching clinics and break down what they do offensively. You know, the, and here's the funny thing because you got to add this when you talk about the quarterback position. What we just said doesn't mean that we don't think that Jackson Arnold is going to be an incredible football player at Oklahoma. Sure. It's like people will take this and run that we think he sucks all of a sudden when it's so far from the case. There's also, to be completely clear, there's a difference between Jackson Arnold looking great in spring and him competing for the starting job. And like this narrative out there. It's that a good a, problem to have. Like, yes. Like, I, I just think people need to realize, don't read into the BS that a lot of these people that are not even there at practice, they're not credentialed media putting the stuff out there. Like, it's just, it's nuts. I shouldn't get mad about it, but it really well, irritates me. The other thing, too, is... Welcome is to the internet. The yeah. idea that, and this this kind of, I've, I've been harping on this for a while. Dylan Gabriel doesn't suck. <laughs> yeah, like he doesn't like he doesn't suck. Did, did was the offense where people thought it was going to be a year ago? I'll be the first one to raise my hand and say no. They underachieved in in certain ways, but I don't think that Dylan Gabriel just sucks as a quarterback. I also talked to somebody that uh, was over at practice a couple days ago, and 
he said that something that's going to be interesting and I you know it's something that we might have to explore once the season begins or maybe even throughout the summer Jeff Levy Matt Wells and Seth Luttrell all working with the quarterbacks has to be a positive thing like that is a that's a big win that I don't think that like almost as much as we've talked about uh Skalski working with the uh, linebackers I mean you have two guys that were proven head coaches I mean Seth Luttrell was one of the bigger names in college football less than two years ago like that he was about to make that jump into the power five and then obviously north texas you know went they went through uh you know their ills uh here over the last couple of years but i think it's a big win getting both of those guys in yeah i mean it's it, it, you, it and i know a lot of people say well it didn't matter last year matt wells was here and the game management sucked and to think that brent venables has not worked on that and not not use this spring and will use next August and has had internal discussions about it. Like, no, he has, he absolutely has. And he and Jeff Levy will, I believe will work together better. And it's just, I don't think Brent is a bury his head in the sand type of guy. We'll see how he uses his timeouts on Saturday. Oh, in the spring game. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) We want to just kill him if he's not using timeouts to uh, stop the clock and stuff. Yeah. But I will say to you, I wouldn't be surprised if they like, if they have a, I mean, they used to have a period and maybe it was just practices, but I want to say Bob might've done some goal line stuff in spring back in the day. Maybe he goes back to that. Well, they, they worked clock uh, management stuff. Oh, just basic clock management. Yeah. Type like stuff. two minute drill and stuff like that. I almost think it'd be more interesting to watch a full practice than yeah. just a fake scrimmage that guys aren't playing hard. Sure. But, I was Although s- I will tell you this, watching a full practice, the only thing that really is interesting after you do that all the time, and you probably know this from the NFL, is team. Yes, correct. But I don't know. I was going to say, though, Carrie, to your point, Britt has said, I mean, he said at his opening press conference before, before spring practice, and I've, I've brought this up a couple times, the being more efficient on both sides of the ball, complementing each other. That That's not directly saying that they need to slow down and they need to do better at game management, but it's hinting at he understands that there were times last year that they were not working well together. And it was because the offense was going three and out in 30 seconds. Right. You know, and I think that that's something that we're going to see them. I, I don't, I'm not saying they're going to totally slow down the offense because sure. I think there's, there's obviously successful moments where you need to go hurry up and that's the way Levy's offense works. But although I, I'll say this going three and out, in 30 seconds is no worse than going three and out in two minutes and 30 seconds. Like, well, it depends it, on the situation. In the yeah, game, it depends though. on the situation, but it's still like you lose a game and everyone finds one little thing that they want to change. If this hadn't happened, we would have won that game. Like you still, there's a million things that happened in a game that cause you to lose it. Like, right. It's like going three and out is bad no matter what. And you're right. It can be situational, but if you're going three and out a lot, you're still not winning a lot of football games. No matter how how much time comes off the clock, yeah. Well, and if you can't get off the field in third down, yeah. it, yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah, and that's the thing. It, and getting turnovers and not doing anything with it—that's complimentary football. I mean, it, it complimentary football is something that's been talked about for a long, long time. I mean, as long as I can remember. Uh, and basically, if you're good on offense and good on defense, you can play complimentary football. It's just a. It's just a. It's kind of become a buzzword for saying we're not very good on one side of the ball or we're not good in special teams. Uh, all right. Uh, coming up this weekend, Kyler Murray is going to have his statue unveiling. I know we're going to talk to Brent Venables or we're, we're scheduled to talk to Brent Venables. Uh, I think Thursday where they're trying to put something together where we can just kind of get a rundown, maybe figure out who's going to be in the game out of the game. Cause that's always interesting, uh, especially at the running back position. Uh, but you, you definitely, you want to see those receivers. You want to see Jaden Gibson. You want to see Nick Anderson. You want to see LV Bunkley Shelton. I mean, you want to see who that third guy could be. Could it be Andrell Anthony? I mean, I think he's the guy that probably people want to see more than anybody at the receiver position. Jaden Gibson was very complimentary of uh, Anthony. Anthony yesterday. It, I mean, he's a he seems like a very likable guy. I mean, from the times we've talked to him, he just. I mean, another one of those guys that's just happy. He came from Michigan, but just happy to be in a situation where he knows they're going to throw the ball. Maybe more so out of 
all of the expected contributors through the portal, he is maybe the biggest question mark for me, just as far as like, where is, where is this? Like, was, did he, did he need a new lease on life? If you will. Uh, like I, I expect Bothroyd to be good. I expect Trace Ford to be good. I expect Reggie Pearson to be somewhat good. I expect Walter Rouse to be good. I just don't know like how Andre Anthony fits in to yeah. It's a good point. The well, offense. It's hard to reconcile. Not, not, not necessarily fits into the offense, but yeah. more so like how how good how can good he be? How good is he? Because seven catches for eighty for eighty yards, you'd say yeah, Michigan does not a high powered offense, but if you're good enough you break on through and you find a way to do things. All right. But, uh, you know, uh, coming up this weekend, Kyler Murray's uh, statue unveiling will be at 1130. Uh, It'll be over there in Heisman Park. So you'll be able to go take part in that before the game starts. Um, And and that should be just a great day. They'll have, you know, the O Club is doing some uh, deal for him uh, downtown in Oklahoma City on Friday night. Uh, so that should be, you know, really good. Just a, a good weekend for Kyler. Uh, George, I know um, you were kind of putting together a Kyler story. You had to, and this is one of those things, we can't really we can't really print this, but it's great to have in a pod because we can talk about these kind of things. But you've been making some calls, reaching out to people, uh, and you got an interesting phone call today. Am I allowed to say who? Yeah, I think you can say. I mean, I, I don't think there's any reason conveying the message. It's just, I, you want to do this? Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> I mean, I, I just, I didn't know if I can say who. But yeah, I mean, I, I reached out to quite a few former players. And then I reached out to a certain former coach um, and the athletic department over where he's coaching now. And um, uh, I got a call this morning from Mr. Lincoln Riley. And um, he will not be quoted in the story, but he was very appreciative of me reaching out and uh, just, you know, he didn't want to basically overshadow this weekend. And I think that that's, I understand where he's coming from on that because I think anything that he says Mm -hmm. uh, will be taken the wrong way by fans and and, and other people. So I I, I appreciated that. But yeah, he gave me a a call, which was very uh, shocking, uh, I will say, but uh but yeah, just working on on some stuff about Kyler and and this weekend, and um, you know, I really didn't think I'd hear back from USC, but to get a call this morning um, from a, a no caller ID was pretty, pretty uh, stunning, I would say. I, I'll say, I mean, everyone knows I have no reason to say anything nice, but I good on him. I mean, yeah, knowing that you know anything with his name on it surrounding Kyler would probably, it, at least in Oklahoma circles, would be taken as Oh, look, he's trying to steal the spotlight. And and I, I think that, you know, and Baker's talked about Lincoln before. I think he talked about it a little bit last year when he was in town for his statue stuff. I don't think there's any ill will, at least from most of the players, especially obviously those those quarterbacks that played for him, because a lot of those guys owe Lincoln, you know, a debt of gratitude. Right, I mean, yeah. obviously Baker's not where he is without Lincoln. Kyler doesn't probably come to Oklahoma without Lincoln being here. They don't have the season that they had. Without that, you know, even Jalen Hurts, who obviously is, you know, having well, huge just signed success, the biggest right? contract yeah. in, in you NFL know, history. those guys, those guys are still very appreciative. And it was very clear from from the brief conversation I had with Lincoln is that he still has a very close relationship uh, with a lot of those guys. That's that's very interesting. I, I'm glad he called you and not me. I'll probably would have gone a little differently. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, by the way, uh, if you want to look sharp for this weekend. Uh, go to deadsoxy.com. Dead Soxy uh, is the uh, standard, the new standard in socks. That's according to uh, GQ. Uh, but we've all got them. You know it. We love them. Uh, the no-shows. Man, the weather has been unbelievable lately. Maybe a little windy, but great great to be outside. Uh, and having the no-shows is a must right now. So if you don't have any, go to deadsoxy.com. D-E-A-D-S-O-X-Y. Dot com. Use that promo code SCOOP and you'll get 25% off your entire order. And that can save you a lot of money because uh, you can load up on some boardrooms, some team colorways, uh, get the crimson package. And uh, they've still got the uh, the wagon socks. They got the Maker Bayfields uh, in stock. I know uh, I've ordered some of them recently. Great customer service as well. Uh, they treat you right. They take care of you. Uh, great packaging. Just a, a, a total luxury sock experience that you want to take part in 
uh, especially coming up, uh, you know, you got uh, holidays coming up, birthdays, whatever, uh, go to deadsoxy.com, use that promo code SCOOP, get 25% off your entire order. You will not regret it because they are great socks. Uh, and as always, stay soxy. Okay, so spring red and white game weekend, Josh. Uh, recruiting has been uh, gearing up for this. How big a weekend are we we looking at? I know there's going to be more coming as, you know, through the week now that you're back from vacation. Yeah, I, I just put up woke. I literally uh, probably 15 minutes ago um, was trying to finish it all Thanks for paying attention morning. to the show. No, uh, well, absolutely was not. Really, your parts in particular just kind of dodge those. But no, um, you know, it looks like a good week. And what I have heard is this is like you start looking at what they've got along the front like the guys that are going to be on campus, the offensive linemen, defensive linemen. Obviously, you start with David Stone, Nigel Smith. I mean, two of their biggest targets, regardless of position. Um, they're both going to be on campus. And you wonder, like, does OU try and get some scenarios where those guys are together and they're hanging out and kind of getting to feel for each other, which I, I could see. That, like, it's one of those deals where they're very much an odd couple, where Nigel's very kept to himself, very quiet, reserved guy. And David knows everybody you know D david it's funny because like i feel like people sometimes get a little annoyed with david david has a lot of gerald mccoy vibes to him like very like friendly very engaging very like wants to interact with people like he has that kind of energy sometimes and i think people kind of read that wrong a little bit so it'd be funny to see them hang out a little bit and see how that goes um one of the guys that, you know, everybody knows I love is the Joseph Jonah Jeanier kid. He's going to be there. Uh, big time defensive end from Conroe up in North Houston. Um, I, I know, I can't remember, I think it was on three or 24 7. One of them recently released their updated rankings, and he, they've got him number 22 overall in the country. I think he is closer to that than where Rivals has him at the moment. I, I think he's a top 100 guy, and I think OU leads for him right now. So uh, to get him back on campus is a really big win. And then you move to the offensive line where you've got Garrett Sexton, the big offensive lineman from Wisconsin, the guy that was a uh, very Lane Johnson-y type story, was a quarterback, I believe, his sophomore year of high school, and is like 6'6", 220, and they're like, why don't you try offensive tackle? They moved him over there. Now he's about 255, 260. Still got a long ways to go, but um, is clearly make you know, his final group is basically Iowa, Oklahoma, and Penn State. Okay. Like, I, I don't need to know a lot else to buy into that offensive lineman. Like, you can probably play some line. Um, and then uh, another big one that I just actually confirmed, and this is kind of what I was waiting on for the pod to, or for me to get woke up during the pod was Jason Zandamella, big offensive lineman from Florida. That is, Rivals has him as a three-star. If there are two or three better centers in the country, I'll be shocked. Like, I think he is really, really good, super athletic guy. Um, and I would expect both position groups to grow considerably. Uh, and there's, you know, there's plenty more we can go over. But um, it should be a very good O-line, D-line group on campus. And I know that's something a lot of people – have kind of wondered about through the spring, like where are the big guys? It sounds like they're kind of saving a lot of those guys for for this point in time. By the way, we got a little breaking news. I think Bob's going to break away uh, to uh, write this, but uh, uh, I know Bob. I I wouldn't say worry is out there, but I mean you've said it before. You're rebuilding a roster right now for your Porter Moser, uh, and they got a nice piece today. Javian McCollum, one of the top transfer guards, uh, you know, according to some services, he was ranked the number ten overall in the transfer portal rankings. So this is not just like some, you know, like oh, all right, he's just going to be a depth a, a depth piece. But he was down to OU, Nebraska, and South Florida. He visited OU a couple of weeks ago. This is a great way to get the ball rolling. They've had five visits here in the last couple of weekends, and I expect. This won't be the only one that could that ends up being a sooner from uh, from those five, but this is someone who's about six foot two, average sixteen points a game. I know they look at Sienna. You got to get over that. That's you know that's not how the portal works. You got to be able to bypass you know looking at the name of the school and and trying to look at what the player brings to the table. And it's clear that OU staff 
prioritized him right from the jump. And now they've got him on board, and I don't think he'll be the only one this week. And you know, I know this first month of the portal window, they didn't do much, but now they are ready to make their move. What real quick? Uh, what are the other must gets in the portal that they're targeting? Oh, bigs, of course, bigs, and they've brought in a couple. There's one that I don't think they're going to get at all, John Hughley from uh, Pittsburgh, but Yo uh, Johan. Treor from Auburn, who was a former five-star for the 2022 class. Still love where they uh, stand there. Van Allen Lubin, who is someone from Notre Dame that was a top 50 prospect for the 2022 class, was recruited to Notre Dame by Ryan Humphrey. A lot of dots to connect there that you would feel pretty good about. You need at least two, two guys in the post, and then you need to find your scoring, your athletic ability. You've got five spots now to sort of work with. And I think they're they're in a better spot than people think. It's just because these guys hadn't gone public, so people are starting to really hit the panic button. But they've done the, this staff has done a tremendous job the last two three weeks of setting the pieces up, and now it's, it's time to let those dominoes fall. The good news for Porter Moser too, and I not to say that there was any worry or concern here, but it seems like Los Uzon has done a pretty damn good job of leading the recruitment charge as far as players go, especially with Johan because they played together. So you know, there's a lot of people that say, oh, Johan's just a stiff. He's not going to do anything. Well, maybe you get him with Los again, and they have that high school magic bring, you know, brought back to life. And it's it's hard to know. You know, Is he someone that only averaged like two, three points per game? Or is he the five-star guy from 2022? Then we just didn't get he didn't get a chance to really show what, what he could do during that, that, that first year. But, yeah, I mean, Los, Otega. That's your cornerstone. That's your foundation. Those guys were never thinking about leaving. And so that is, you know, if you're looking toward Porter Moser saying, yeah, I got to bring in my guys, those were his guys from the jump. And now we're, you know, getting to see, can he hit with the portal? He can't miss. There's no, there's no more missing allowed when it comes to the portal classes. Everyone you've got has got to be exactly who you thought they would be when you bring them in. All right, Bob, we'll uh, let you get to uh, go right. And uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything basketball-wise that we needed to hit on, but I think that pretty much covers it. So They'll be looking for some support staff now, too, with Clayton yeah, Custer yeah, going yeah. back with the Ramblers and Matt Gordon going to Valpo. So the couple guys that Porter and Moser has known for years and years and years now getting their assistant coaching careers started. Well, I think that – what I've said about the current state of the basketball program will prevent myself from getting either of those jobs, but that's okay. Uh, football recruiting. Back to that. <laughs> uh, anyway, Josh, uh, over the weekend, do you think there are any chances? Are, are you predicting or, or looking at any possible commitments on the spot? He muted himself. Josh. He muted himself or he walked away. One of the two. Wow, the basket. I muted myself. Damn it, I <laughs> muted myself. And you know what? I, and why is I was looking up information on a basketball transfer. I should have known that was that was going to lead me down the wrong path. So um, that's my fault. But um, as far as um, anybody, like, I don't really foresee any immediate commitments. Like, I think one or two are possible. I, you've got the two. Um, in-state DB offers and Devin Jordan from Tulsa Union, Michael Patterson McDonald uh, from Dell City, uh, excuse me, Westmore. Um, I, I think those are a couple you look at and you just kind of wonder. Like, I mean, it makes sense if, if you think about it. Um, but I don't get the impression talking to either of those guys that they're, that they're at that point right now. Um, so, you know, we'll have to kind of see where it goes. But again, guys, like this is kind of what we talked about. Like, when you have this patient methodology, you don't get these big runs on, you know, where guys get swept up in the momentum because that's not what Brent Venables wants you to do. He doesn't want you to get caught up in the moment and then make a decision and then, like, you know, two months later realize that's maybe not what I should have done. So I, I think you're going to see a more patient approach from most of these guys. But if if one guy popped off in surprise, no, I don't, I don't think that's um, – I don't think that's out of the question or anything, but if it's more than two, I would be fairly stunned. What were your, uh, I, I guess they kind of went in line with uh, any time that you go on a vacation, but uh, what were your thoughts when you returned home and saw that KJ Daniels had pulled the trigger? Yeah. 
Yeah, that that was great. I was literally just landing in Houston when that was going on, and like I'm getting messages from you guys and and Nick Harris and everything, and you're like, oh, okay, this is perfect timing. Um, I, you know, he's a guy again, Eddie. We saw at Under Armour uh, last month. Um, re, a smaller guy, you know, listed at about 5'10", 160 right now. Uh, really explosive. You can see it on tape. All he does is it's just vertical touchdown after vertical touchdown. He really can stretch the field. Um, is a guy that I think um, it, I, I, I guess I'm a little surprised that OU pushed as hard as they did early on. But for them to do so, clearly Emmett Jones likes this guy. This is a guy they wanted to go because I think they were all lined up to get the Isaiah McMorris kid from Nebraska. And I think, you know, um, KJ was just more willing to go. He was ready to make that decision. And so he went ahead and did it. And I think that really – just simplifies the field a little bit. Like now we kind of know like Zion Kearney, Bryant Wesco, they get to, and again, like we talk about it, these things grow on each other. Okay. You've got one guy. Okay. All you receivers, you know, the six of you, I really like, I got three spots or I got four spots or whatever it is. Emmett Jones can go to those guys and be like, I'm not pressuring you. I'm just telling you once the seats are taken, I don't have any more for you. So I, I think you start to see some of that because I obviously guys, we've talked about wide receiver, all off season. Like that's going to be a huge portion of this class. They have to get that right. And I think it's why they were willing to jump through so many hoops to get him at Jones because they believe he can get those kind of guys. But KJ Daniels is, is a slot. And, and that's what I like is I worried a little bit that Oklahoma was getting a little too formulaic in their receivers. I was just seeing the same kind of guys over and over well, again, these big Stoops. body. And, you know, and so, so like, I'm like, I, you, you got to have some variation. You got to have the guy that can go across the middle. You've got to have the guy that can run the quick slant and you've got to have the vertical guy. So like, I mean, I white get people. The, that. I mean, why do I hate white people? I miss something terrible that's, here. You, the, uh, I, that's what I'm hearing from you. You don't like white people in the slot. I, well, I mean, I'm self-loathing for sure, but that's a different thing altogether. Um, no, but again, I, I just like. I like the variation that it gives him. And again, he still fits the mold because I we all know Jeff Levy, he wants to challenge downfield and, and Daniels is absolutely a guy that can do that. I think fans want to know like what, okay, three star, yay. What are the chances he's going to move up? I think it's pretty decent. I, I, I There's no reason he couldn't be a four star. I mean, like I said, with that kind of speed. And again, the nice thing about it is that I was really trying to figure out if I needed to go see him possibly this spring, or if I needed to go find a way to get up to Nebraska and go see the McMorris kid. Now I kind of have my answer. Like I kind of know which direction I got to go. And frankly, I'd much rather go to Louisiana because there's more guys I can stop and see on the way. Um, so I, I am, I, I will get by to see him. And if I think, you know, Hey, this guy's got to make a move up, then that's fine. I, <laughs> The problem, and I'll be perfectly honest about this, a problem for me with KJ is I saw him at Under Armour. I saw him go through drills. I saw him do the, um, oh, the, I don't even know what they call it. If they do it at the combine every year where you start off with your back and then you run down the straight line and you're just catching passes back and forth. Um, it's almost like a slalom. The gauntlet. For receivers. Yes, I, I can never think of what the word is. So I saw him do that and he looked great. The only rep I saw him take in one-on-ones is a picture I took, and it's the picture we've got of him, and it looks in the picture like he's catching the ball. He actually drops the ball. But the picture works so well, I didn't even care. But it's the only rep I have in my head, and he dropped the ball, and I'm like, I, what do I draw from that? Because like, it's the only point I have from one-on-ones, but it's not a great point, and it doesn't match up with anything else I've seen from him. So I have this little little thing in my brain that I can't quite shake out, but I'll go see him. I'm sure that will get answered. And uh, again, I, there's no reason that he can't be a four star. Now, do I think he's going to be a top 100 guy? No, probably not. But the thing I would remind people, his measurables are better than Marquise Brown's were coming out of a year of junior college. Like I'm not saying he's going to be Marquise Brown. I'm just saying I get people are like, Oh, he's five, 10, 150. So what? Like what, what he's not at Allen high school. He's not at Denton Geyer where they've got him on a weight program and the booster clubs feeding him eight meals a day. Like it, it doesn't work like that. So 
He is just at a place where he is a good football player and he plays football. And once he gets to a major college campus like Oklahoma, he'll grow. Like, it's not like he's a little framed. I mean, he's not six, five, but he's not like a midget or anything. Yeah. It probably wouldn't hurt if he starts getting better offers too. Yeah. I know every, like I've had a lot of that, like, Oh, why doesn't he have better? And I mean, I, I, I get it, but I, I think that's one of those things where Oklahoma almost hurts themselves. They went in early enough and everybody else is like, well, we're not like who, who is going to go offer him that either won't, uh, that is going to impress Oklahoma fans and won't scare off Oklahoma fans. Like, do you want him <laughs> to have that LSU offer? Okay, cool. I don't think it's going to go the way you want it to go. Yeah. Um, you know, at the same time, like, so say Auburn offers him. Okay, I, I guess. I mean, I, maybe that's impressive. Maybe that gets you excited. It's certainly better than what he has, but it's not I, – I, I don't know. Like, wide receiver is one of those positions where – I think people tend to focus – like, there are enough good wide receivers in the world that you can win a lot of different ways. Like, it's not like corner. You can't find enough corners. There's a reason teams love running five wide. Because our five wide receivers, the odds are, are a hell of a lot better than your five corners or your five DBs. Like, almost invariably, that will be the case. So, you don't have – like – this idea that they've all got to be the best guy. I mean, just stop that. Like find the guys that can run what you want to do. And again, this is clearly a guy that Emmett Jones preferred and wanted and he pushed for him and they closed on him. All right. Um, George, you look like you had something to say. I was just going to ask Josh, cause everybody is always talking about it. And I think I asked you about him a couple of weeks ago, but how big is it to get David Stone in? This week, and I know he's here all the time, and we've talked about this a million times. But just to get him in on this big of a weekend, I I think it's huge. I mean, and I the and it, what's funny is I don't think I realized that this was David's first spring game. I mean, because obviously even the previous staff was heavily involved with David, so he's been around OU for three seasons now. So it kind of shocks me that this is his first one. But again, man, when I I talk to people. Like the only reason anybody can come up with that Oklahoma is in any trouble is just does mom feel comfortable with him being back around, you know, some of the people maybe that, for, you know, from his hometown or people that he grew up around. Like that's the only thing people are coming up with. And I just, with the kind of like maybe, a, maybe in a different scenario, I could think that's a bigger deal. But like Todd Bates is like a father figure. Like I, I just don't see that being a losing hand like I, I just I think he can overcome that I, I genuinely believe that um so I but as far as the spring game itself it's huge I mean it it says a lot and I think it is interesting that like we talk about David being there all the time and he is but it rarely gets like he rarely acknowledges it I think it's interesting that David was willing to say like yeah I'm gonna be there I'll be around and I, I think that's another positive sign and like I said it's great for, you know, the the kind of group you're going to have on campus when you've got Joseph Jonah Jeanne, you know, David Stone, Nigel Smith, uh, Logan Thomas. I, I didn't mention him earlier, the big defensive end from uh, Katie Paytow, uh, Pato. God, I, I do it wrong every time. Um, all those guys there, I mean, that could be your defensive line class, like, and, and would be one of the best defensive line classes OU has signed in a generation. So I, I think that is exactly what you're aiming for and it's what you hope and it's it's what they were so close to doing last year but maybe this year you can start to build it and you have those guys also you know around pj at a and you know they talk to williams and Ari, and you start to really build those bridges where you start really you know look what this defensive line could be in a couple of years like look what they're putting out there now and you know no offense to those guys but look how much better it could be in two or three years What's a what's an early number on just how many of these are officials? Well, I don't expect any officials, honestly. Okay. Like, the, 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 I mean, that's just I, like I don't know. I don't remember Brent ever coming out and stating that. But I don't. I mean, like they didn't do it last year, and it, it surely seems like that is their policy. That the first 
officials they're going to do is those of those first few weeks in June. And, you know, obviously for, you know, I know we'll have some people that wonder the first big week, it looks like it's going to be that Ju- uh, June 16th through the 18th. That'll be the barbecue weekend. Uh, going to have a bunch of people up. They'll, they'll blow it out like they did last year. And that's when, when you really start to see, Oh, you taken off, like they'll get some commitments between here and there. But I think that mid June to, you know, first week in August, that's really, again, just like last year, that's where you're going to see that big run, I would guess. All right. Uh, anything else that we need to hit on recruiting-wise, Josh? Um, no. Uh, you know, I, I will say just, uh, you know, uh, just one other quick guy that I did want to acknowledge just being there that is a guy that I currently expect to be part of the class. It, you know, and he, I think he tweeted it out last night, is Caden Durham, the big running back from Duncanville, which – Kind of like what I was talking about earlier with David Stone. When David made that announcement, hey, I'm going to be there, Caden didn't start his own tweet. He just quote tweeted David and was like, hey, I'll see you there, man. Like these, and, and you know, they know each other through, you know, Michael. Like they've got a relationship with Caden being a former Oklahoma City area guy. So there are a lot of interconnected pieces that will all be on campus this weekend. And that's what you're looking to build. You start, you know, you think back through all these years and I go all the way back to, you know, like that year with like Trent Smith and Rocky Kalmus and all those guys, when they show up and are like, we're all going to go here. We're doing this together. We're, you know, and that was the foundation of the 2000 national championship team. I, again, that's a lot to lay at the feet of these guys, but I'm just saying that's what you are hoping to build is some camaraderie amongst them as a group. All right. Um, yeah. Outside of that, uh, I mean, we've talked, a little bit of spring sportage, uh, not a lot to cover there. So, uh, just looking forward to the spring game on Saturday and and uh, stories that are going to come out of that. And uh, stay tuned. We will probably have a special pod, uh, you know, that we put together from talking to people out at Baker's uh, charity event at Top Golf. So uh, that should be out this weekend as well. What do you guys think the crowds are going to be on Saturday? I'd say forty-five to fifty. Yeah, something like that. You're in my brain. I, would I don't have said think the it's exact same thing. I don't think it's going to be 75 like it was a no. year ago. Uh, I would say 45, 50 ish. Anything over 50 is a win. It hasn't really been the push there was a year ago either. I don't I mean, feel the like whole... they. I don't feel like they feel like they need to. I think last year was more of like a celebration of uh, obviously Baker, but I think it was more of a celebration of like. Moving on, getting out yeah. of this 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 rut that the program was in. I, this is more of I think and I don't want to say run of the mill, but I feel like it's more run of the mill. Like no disrespect to Kyler or anything like that, but I you know it just it doesn't feel like it's going to be anything crazy. And I say crazy, I mean getting fifty thousand people for a practice is well, and it doesn't help the weather is insane. Be, the weather's going to be, you know, I think it's supposed to be pretty windy and cold, which kind of sucks. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's I like low 60s, right? But if there's sun, I don't think it's going to be too bad. I think it's going to be well attended. Well, it, it always has been well attended. I think just last year was just a whole new bar. But. I'm 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 I mean, I realize you know the way that it's worked out and you know there's a different scoring system this year, which is kind of it's always hard to follow that during the game, um which I don't think it's always necessary to do special scoring i think you just do it and it's a scrimmage and people watch it and one team might have 10 more points who cares but uh i i think it's gonna be great see because my favorite part last year was just baker being on the field being recognized showing the highlight video uh i'm gonna love that part of of saturday probably the most because i'm I'm just glad that kyler's getting his own you know time to shine yeah, and I, you know, I don't think there'll be. Didn't didn't Brent last year do something where he had like all the former players, right, yeah. come down? Yeah. Like I don't think that's gonna be a, a thing again this year. No, I do think it's still gonna be. It, I, I think it's for the alumni. It's still a big weekend of, yeah. you know, celebration or whatever you want to call get it. To have guys, that Friday night, yeah, yeah, guys coming back. I think it's gonna be cool to a certain extent, but. Uh, you know, more than anything, getting a bunch of these NFL guys back, whether it be Orlando or Baker or Kyler, or, you know, Grant Calcaterra or Blake uh, Bell, whoever, you know, just having those guys back on campus, I think is probably a, it's a positive. It has to be a positive when you get them around the team and when you get them around, uh, you know, future recruits or whatever. Looking forward to it. Uh, 
Maybe we'll see some of you guys out there, but uh, appreciate uh, everybody listening and uh, always checking out the Unofficial 40 podcast, and uh, we'll be back again uh, in another week to wrap up the spring, uh, and that'll be good after having watched the uh, spring game as well uh, to kind of talk about you know who really shined uh, on Saturday. So looking forward to it. We'll see you again back here next week for another edition of the Unofficial 40 podcast from Soonerscoop.com.